subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV. Hello, our lovely viewers, watching us from your homes. You are welcome to SHR on Joy Learning. This is your teacher, Osel Kwanya Martin, also called Sir Boys. I'm going to take you through SHS 1, topic in elective biology. This is our second lesson in any class that you get to. The topic for today is the scientific skills. At the end of our studies, I expect you, the student, to be able to describe the skills used by a biologist in their work. Describe the method of science used to solve problems and describe the steps for writing a report on biological investigation. The question may be, why do you need these skills? Take your time and think about it. Every job, every career, every profession has a skill that is needed to be able to undertake their job successfully. Be it a mechanic, be it a doctor, be it a pharmacist. Even in politics, you need to be trained on some skills. To act on a stage, you need to be trained on some skills. So we, the scientists too, have our own skills that you should uh, uh, grow up getting or having as a skills on your hand. You are going to use every day in your job. I believe you go to the hospital and you see doctors or lab technicians working. It may fascinate you, or it may look also easy. You may think like, oh, it's something I can do. I can just pick this and do it that way. No. <laughs> it's skills that they've grown over a long time, and it looks like it's part of their day-to-day -day life. Yes, most of our skills that we use in science, it's not only for we, the scientists. As I said in our previous lesson, that the word science is not for us. It's for everybody. So to be able to apply a body of a subject, pass it through a scientific method, then you who are going to pass it through the scientific method, you should be able to have the skill needed to undertake a scientific method. Yes, so this skill that I said, is a skill to help you undertake a scientific method. So anybody in any field who can undertake a scientific method should be able to have these skills that I'll be talking about. So as much as it's for the science failed to have it, anybody who applied this, whether in media, whether in politics, whether in sports, whether in military, you should be able to use their skills. And as you keep using their skills, it will become part of you each day. They are not weird skills. They are skills even you have some at your fingertips. You may be using it each and every time, but you may just not know you are doing that. So sit with me. And I'm going to blow your mind with some things that you already know and help you position yourself well in the class. If you're in a boarding school, use this a lot. If you're in the day school too, always use this. Anywhere you go, apply the scientific skills. It's going to give you a certain way of thinking and seeing things differently from the layman. So let's begin. There are a lot of skills that we need. And the first on the list of our skills is observation. Every scientist is very observant. This observation is not about just looking at something that occurs. No. This is an observation with a critical mind, a critical eye, a critical sense. So we mostly say the observation is the act of noting or perceiving a phenomenon or an event that occurs in nature carefully and in an orderly manner. I'll take it again. The act of noting or perceiving a phenomenon or about event in nature in a carefully and orderly manner. That two words, carefully, orderly manner, 
means that it's not just a common skill anybody can get or have. For example, you get to your kitchen and you can smell something. You may just know maybe it's from the gas cylinder. But how sure are you that this one comes from the gas cylinder? Or you get to your kitchen and some cups have been toppled onto the floor. Definitely, you may have to guess. You have to observe it, but you have to observe a critical eye based on how the thing is positioned. It will tell you something. These are common things in your house. But if you come to the environment, there are a lot of things that happen that we, the advanced scientists or mature scientists, can just see something and just make a guess. For example, what happens if every set for some seasons you see leaves falling? Every season, or a particular season, you see it raining very heavily or rains with a lot of wind in it. To the layman, it's raining. But to you, the scientist, you have observed something differently. So when we observe, we just don't observe like the layman. We observe with a keen eye, a keen sense, or sense organs, which the layman will not apply his. Now the sense organ we are talking about are the five sense organs you have. Your sense of smell, perception, your taste, your skin. All these senses are used. It's not only your eye. Sometimes you may not be able to use your normal senses to observe things. You need what we call the extension of senses. What do I mean? You have an eye that you used to see. But if you use a microscope, it will let you see smaller things. In that case, microscope is helping, helping you observe. If you want to measure the temperature change, you can't just put your hand in the environment and say it is cold or it is hot. Sometimes you need a thermometer. So to observe does not only use your only five senses, but equipment or instruments that help extend the use of your senses, gather data for you, are important in your observation. So as I said, as you go along, you'll be finding out how to be adding up and modifying the observation well. When you observe these things, to the layman, his leaves just fell. He just saw the leaves on the floor. But to the science student who is very observant, will be careful to say these leaves are young leaves or they are mature leaves. These leaves that fell on the ground, there are some patches on it. These leaves have bats at it just bees. Why is it happening? To the layman, he's not going to look at it from critical, the critical angle because it just fell and all, the, all that you say that leaves are falling on the ground. But we, the scientists, are very, very careful. Every little thing, we watch it well. So we watch the big picture and we also look for the fine details. So the big picture is that it has fallen down. But the fine details is which leaves fell down. Is it the young ones or the matured ones? It will send a signal to us. Is it those with green patches or yellow patches on them? It will send a signal to us. Which, what are the shapes of the leaves that fell? It will send signals to us. So as I'm saying, scientists will not observe like the normal lay person. Again, if you have a file that defecates maybe on your veranda, if you have a critical eye and the color of the African matter are different, you, it will raise an alarm. Though everybody will see the file <laughs> defecating, we the scientists will see beyond that. That is what we call observation in science. Not just seeing, but seeing with an eye that sees something different. Then you identify a problem in it. As I said, the file would Defecate. Once we come yellow, you see green things in it. Then it raises a signal. So you are going to ask, why are they green materials in their fecal matter? Why, are, why is the fecal matter yellow? Why did the young leaves fail, not the older leaves? Why are leaves, those that have fallen down, 
with yellow patches. So we identify a problem in what we have observed. If there's no problem in what you have observed, then it's just a normal observation, then you have not observed anything. If it rains, as we all know in our country, we always say that it will flood. But then there will be a pattern in it that we will observe a problem in it. So as a scientist, mm. just don't observe. In the observation, find out something that catches your attention, ask a question, or we put observation in a question form. So when we put observation in a question form, which you say we have identified the problem in the observation, then the way we put that observation, why is this happening? Why is it that in the dry season, leaves fall? Then we'll just try to get an answer for it. You may guess it. You may try by reading books. You may ask adults or other scientists. You may do all that you need to get an answer. But that possible answer is given, which should be an educated one because you train in the field of science, cannot just talk anyhow. You have to talk in the way scientists talk. So by your training, we say you've been educated within the field. And you give answers that comes from that educated line of thinking for possible solution to that question. So we mostly define hypothesis as a suggested or a possible or educated explanation. We prefer the one the educated gets because no scientist would just talk like a non-scientist. He has to talk inferring, basing on his experience of how things happen. Let's give us a typical example. One scientist called Catherine Payne wanted to know why when wheels move, all of a sudden they stop. He was just stating wheels in the sea, and he saw that at a certain time, all the wheels will stop. They will all kind of move in a certain direction. Now, it could be they are traumatized. It could be a ship was moving. But Catherine Payne, being a scientist, an experienced scientist, saw that it happens in elephants. And the elephants own was that they're able to communicate with a sound that we, Human beings can't hear it because of the wavelength of how they hear it. So Catherine Payne, basing on how elephants communicate with a tone that is lower than what we can hear, predicted and guessed, that's what we said, predicted or guessed that it could be the same idea. So that means she has been educated in one field. She has transferred that educated reasoning to possibly getting an answer for why it is happening. That is just an answer. The answer has not been tested, so we can't accept it. But we will just put it there and say, it could be true or it could be false. So science cannot just take your word and say, it is true. So we have to then do what? Investigate your answer and find out whether this statement is true or not. So when you make an hypothesis. Scientists need to move a certain step to find out what you said is true. So you just can't talk like a layman, say something, argue it, and say, and that's a fact. We should take it. And what I said is true. I know it's true. No, we don't work like that in science. So everything in your textbook, you read in physics, you read in chemistry, you read in biology, have been tested, proven, and it's true before we wrote the books, gave it to you. So everything you are learning at that stage has been proven, as of now, to be true. And you have to accept it. Another one was formulating hypothesis. Now that you have the hypothesis I gave to you, let's give hypothesis like what happens if you put plant in a cupboard and make a hole at one end, from our GHS, we will say that the leaves would bend towards 
that hole. That's all we say. So because they, they are putting a, a, a dark place and there's a light coming from, it will bend towards the light. That was the hypothesis we have. Another one was, is light necessary for photosynthesis? Somebody say, say yes. Somebody say no. Because I would say that when always it's the morning prior to the evening, we see light, uh, the plant growing up, becoming greener, blossoming, so light is important. Somebody may also say that while there was no light, it can also grow. These are arguments. These are ideas put forth. So scientists will take time and test them. That testing is called experimentation. But before we can go to experimentation, scientists need to do two other things before we can go to experimentation. First is formulating the hypothesis that you gave, the educated guess you gave. You would have to put the educated guess into a well-defined scientific problem. That can be tested. So that statement is called a testable statement. Again, when you get your hypothesis that you gave, oh, probably the whole stopped for any reason. Whatever the reason, that it could be that they heard a sound or they are communicated by another quail, tells us that we have to put in a form that we can test it. The other one I gave was, per some seasons, all leaves fall. So let's say it's in the dry season. Somebody will just say, in the dry season, we've observed that young leaves fall. That's your statement. But we have to put in a way that we can test it. OK. To, after putting that statement, you put it in another form again we call the prediction, or the way we predict the outcome of the experiment. Most of the time, we've termed it the if-then statement. Why do we use the word if-then statement? It makes the experiment easy to be tested. The if-then statement. What it means is that we are stating in advance what will happen if we take a certain step, then the outcome. So, for example, a slight necessary for photosynthesis. If light is present, then photosynthesis will occur. Look at how I put it. If light is present, then photosynthesis will occur. If light is absent, then no photosynthesis will occur. So I put a condition, the experiment you are going to do. So light should be there, something should be there, then we test whether photosynthesis will occur. If the light is there, we test, and for this answer, okay, then our statement is not true. If we put, we put the light out and we, plant, we put a plant somewhere in the dark and the plant still photosynthesizes, then our statement is also not true. So these skills are not skills you just, after today that I am just teaching, you just stand up and say, I'm a great scientist, I can use it. It will take you time that your teachers and your mentors and me big men will take you through day by day. And over years, you would become conversant with it. So to put an experiment together, always we write on the top the if condition and the possible outcome we want, it, we want to get. So that if the outcome supports what we put as hypothesis, then we say the hypothesis is true. If the outcome does not support our hypothesis, then it's not true. So before I go into experimentation, let's recap it again. What do you remember I said is the first most important skill? The first one is to observe. As you get to your school, from your gate, to your classroom, what have you observed? Have you observed your teachers the way they teach? Have you observed your friends? Have you observed what goes on at the canteen, the student canteen? Have you observed the water you drink? Have you observed the pattern of your own day-to-day -day life? Have you observed the seasons in our country? Have you even observed when particular food uh, crops are available? So as a scientist, we, our brains never stop working. 
never stop observing. Every day you're observing something. From observation, you said that you formulate your observation into a question. That means you identify a problem in it. If there's, no, there's nothing to identify, then you've not observed it, then just discard what you observed. But once you observe, you observe with a keen eye to find a problem in it. Then, the problem that you state, you give your possible educated guess to it, which is called a hypothesis. Which you said that it's the possible educated guess that we give as answers to an identified question. Once you get that question, you put in a testable statement. In the statement, you put in a form that can be predicted. The if-then statement. If light is, the hypothesis was, light is necessary for photosynthesis. I didn't put it in any form. Light is necessary for photosynthesis. But then, in the prediction, I said, if light is present, then, then the statement, then, there will be photosynthesis. The experimentation. An experimentation is a process of testing a hypothesis by carrying out careful, careful and meaningful procedure under controlled conditions. When you, dis when you came up with the prediction, if light is present, then photosynthesis has to take place. You'd have to sit down and design a procedure, a process that this idea you put down logically can be investigated. The experiments you read were designed by scientists. You too can sit down and design your own experiment based on what you have put together. So there's no fast rule about how I want to observe something. It's up to you to carefully sit down, plan, design, and carry out your investigation. But things you are supposed to note about experimentation or experiment is that there are fundamental things you should do. First of all, you should have two experiments set up usually in the lab when it comes to the lab experiments. Two. But you can repeat it as many times you want to just be sure of yourself. We have what we call the actual experiment and the control experiment. Back to the example you are using, is light necessary for photosynthesis? So the key thing that we are looking at is, is light necessary? Then photosynthesis will follow. So we are going to do an experiment to see the effect of light on plant, whether it leads to photosynthesis. So we are going to have one experiment that will have the light, the, the plant exposed to light, and another one, the plant not exposed to light. In these two experiments, one will be called the actual, one will be called the control. Because you said light is necessary, we also have to do another opposite one where there's no light. And when we measure the outcome, we can conclude well. Per authorities and what we've been using in our field, the actual experiment is the setup in which the one factor or variable we are experimenting on is absent. In every experiment, you have to keep all the factors in the setup going. You can only manipulate one at a time. You don't manipulate two, three, and get confused. Because we are measuring an outcome of something. We don't need to measure two, three, where they are all combined in a process, and you can't tell which one is affecting the experiment. So we do it one at a time. So if it is light, we put one in the sun and we put one in the dark. All are related to light. So the one without the factor we are measuring is called the actual. But there is the debate in the field of science. We mostly say this idea of actual control experiment comes from the hypothesis frame work. In some experiments, the actual has the real factor being 
measured. The control may have the absent. In some, the actual have the absent. The control will rather have it. But for our books and for what we have accepted in most of our standard books and per our exams, the control one is the one that have the factor present. The actual has a factor absent. Why did I try to bring this distinction? If you want to study the effect of germination or how seeds germinate, we boil some seeds and we allow some to be live. The bored one rather is the control, but the live one is the actual one. If you want to find respiration in a sand, you put one in a muslin bag, you put a lime in a conical flax, you tie it and you cork it. That one is the actual one. Then you can bend or heat the other soil, do the same thing and check. For this one, that becomes a control. So as you go along, you'll be getting confused. But for the SHS level, keep it that the control is the one in which the factor is absent. Sorry, the control is the one in which the factor is present. The actual is the factor, is the one with the factor absent. But as you go along, as I said, the framework of the hypothesis will determine which one becomes a control. So be careful as you read. Don't be fixed too much on it. But for exams, keep what we are giving to you. Then the third word that you come across is a controlled experiment. So what have you studied right now? Study the experiment, the definition. You said that there's only one factor that we experiment on per time. You have said that at each stage, there are two experiments you have to put up in a lab. I use the word in a laboratory. In a laboratory, I'll explain why. We have the actual and we have the control. These two are together called the controlled experiment. In which the variables are put in one and not put in another, so we are controlling it. Other dimension is that the experimenter or the scientist can control some factors in it as and when he, the experimenter, wish to get a certain desired result. So controlling it per what he wants is a, also a controlled experiment. Setting the two in a lab where one has it, one doesn't have it, you have also controlled the whole setup. So it's also a controlled experiment. So that word controlled experiment is a broader uh, concept in which the variable operating are regulated or adjusted according to the experimenter's desire with the aim of obtaining a set of objectives. I said it, yes, in the lab. When you go to the field, some experiments are conducted in the field. Scientists would want to do an experiment on lions, on cobras, on python, and stuff. <laughs> you don't have a second chance of controlling these animals. It's in the open. If you go to the sea and you are doing an experiment, there's no easy to control those things. These are the live field experiment. That's why I said that to get a control and an actual, usually is the one done in the lab. But the open field ones, some you can't have a control there. It's just an experiment and record the outcome for it to come out. In every, why do we set up the control, the second one? It is done so that we can compare it to the original or the actual experiment or the real experiment. So that we can know the effect that when light is there, we saw something happen in the leaves. When light was not there, so we can then say that without light, we saw another action, which can tell us the outcome of the light and the absence of the light. If that one was not there, we cannot even know the truth that it was the light that made photosynthesis take place or not. So that's why we need the control experiment for comparison to make sure that our outcomes are accurate and we can interpret and make a conclusion and say that when this was there, 
we saw it. When we took it out, we saw this effect. Another example was how scientists wanted to know the effect of elements on the growth of plants, or mineral elements on the growth of plants. They decided to put a set of elements in one. Then they put the same set in another, minus one. So there were 14 elements they put in one. Then they did the other one, 13, so minus one. Then whatever they minus, they will check the weakness or the effect it produced on the plant and check when the other one was there so that we can say that the absence of carbon gives us this. The presence of carbon gives us that. That is why always scientists have to do two experiments or set up two experiments called the control and the actual. It is different from repeating experiment over and over. When you are repeating experiment over and over, you are trying to cross-check if your facts or data are accurate or the result that we keep getting is consistent. But the, comp the two just give you a better comparison to know your, whether your results are very accurate and true. Whenever two, we have an experiment, there's something we call dependent and independent variables or factors that we measure. In the experiment I gave to you, a slide necessary for photosynthesis. Who is so independent that it doesn't need the other to come before the other one has to be measured? To make it simple, you find out that the light is needed before photosynthesis can take place. So photosynthesis depends on light. So if you can measure an outcome of food in a leaf, which is the dependent on the light, then we call the photosynthesis dependent variable or factor. But when we measure the light itself, which has no correlation whether it will be, a light can be there, whether food will be made or not, that is not what we need. But the light has a process in photosynthesis. So the light on itself being measured is the independent variable. But the photosynthesis that comes as a result of the light is the dependent variable. So note it, every day we will measure two things in an experiment. Once we have an experiment and we conduct it, we'll be recording, you see scientists recording a lot of things on paper. What they are recording is the outcome of the experiment. Mostly we call it data. What scientists are writing on their paper is recording what, is, what they are seeing on a paper. Whatever they are recording at the outcome of the experiment is called the data. Now, data collection is a skill that you also have to learn. Then after data collection, you learn how to organize it. Before you can even collect the data, you need to know how to measure or determine measurement of an experiment. So what am I saying? In every experiment, once you put the setup, you would have to have a skill to measure what the result, the experiment is churning out. So does it require you using a ruler to measure something? Does it require you using a thermometer to measure and every day keep the measurement of the, the readings of the thermometer somewhere to your body temperature. We will measure it and put it down. Whatever we are putting it down is a measurement. And whatever we have put down is a data. So as we go deeper into this, that skill of using an instrument Ability to handle equipment, to set up an experiment, and to measure an experiment is what we call the manipulation of practical skills. Your third this is your second lesson. As you go along, you'll be using the microscope. You'll be using the ruler to do a lot of things. You'll be using the thermometer to do a lot of things. You'll be using the calorimeter to do a lot of things. You'll be using the lens in your physics to do something. 
you'll be using the pipette and the bread to use something. All these are manipulation of skills. And what, how to read the many scores on a, a pipette or a birette are all important skills that you are supposed to know. So by the time you finish SHS, you have come across all these equipment and you can read them. Once you use these equipment to get your measurement, what you have written down is called your data. So you have a, 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 a beaker and you pour water into it. Then you measure it. Then you pour it to, into maybe a plant and look at how the plant reacted with the water. If you take another one, you reduce it. That one, there will be a number. So as you keep writing these numbers down, these numbers are becoming data. And how the data reacts is what you are going to look at. So once you have the data collected, we have to organize it. So the data that you get are always not in numbers. Data that we get are always not in numbers. Some are descriptions. If I tell you to measure the color of people in your class, you can't measure it easily. You may describe sometimes the incident of an experiment. For example, you may say some are very fair. Some are very fair like whites. Some are half caste, or what we call half caste in our country. So by using the word rather not giving figures, not writing like 2 centimeters, 6 centimeters, 8 centimeters, 10 centimeters, not writing it in numbers, but are describing the event by color, by shape, by this, by that, by not giving numbers, we are talking about qualitative data. But if you were able to measure everything that you did in numbers, in numerical forms, in weights, in centimeters, in currency, whatever that is in numbers, we call it quantitative data. So get it. You can describe some things in words, in descriptions, or how it appears. Or you can measure it in numbers, in any form of numbers. We call it that one quantitative. R describing it is called qualitative. Don't forget this too. You come across it a lot in your science class. When you have this data, it makes no sense. If you measure plenty things there, for example, if you go to your class and say, a class of 40, give us the height of, of every student. And you write, the first person is, let's say, 1 meter 60 centimeters. Second one, 1 1.7. Third one, 1 1.8. 1 1.4. 1 1.8. And you just write it just like that. They are just raw figures. It makes no sense. So what will we do is that the raw figures that you give, let's say, and after the raw figures, you saw that seven of them, seven students, were one point, let's say, six, zero. Four students are one point five, five. Let's say nine students are 1.71. And let's say the last figure, let's say five students are 1.62. This makes no sense to anybody. They are just figures. How would you use these figures to make sense? You would have to process the data into a meaningful form so that a lay person will not get confused just raw figures or raw statement, but put it in an organized form that makes sense. And once you put it into a process organized form that makes meaning, we call that one information. So data is raw. When it's processed, it's called information. That process of organizing, the process where we transfer from data to information is when we say organizing data. 
So let's go back. With this, how do you feel if you see something like this? And all of a sudden, I have 1.50, 1.60, 1.70, 1 1.80 here. So seven of them are, let's say, 1.60. Let me go back. Rather, we have, let's say, 1, 1. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. So it will make sense when we say 1.6 are seven students. Four students, four students are 1.55. Nine students are one point. Seven two nine students are one point seven two and five students are this with this rough picture that you see there and with the numbers that you got, you see that the graph, this rough graph. Makes it easy to see that some are taller, some are shorter, some are this way. It makes it easy for you. So it brings some kind of sense to the raw data you had. And this is what we call organizing a data. So from your JHS, as you are in my second class, you were taught some statistics. You were taught bar graph, the bar chart, the pie chart, a lot. We were taught about tables, when you put things in tables. These are all ways and means that you can organize your data. So we don't mostly like raw work. So scientists will do the raw work somewhere. They will come and present the outcome in an organized data. Now we say process data may reveal patterns that were not obvious when the raw data was first collected. And that is true. When I just put it in numbers, I may not observe that maybe one student is very tall because it may just be in the middle of the numbers. But once I put it together, I'll see one student very tall and I'll ask why to reveal that student out. When you get your data, you have to discuss and analyze it. We say analyzing data is a process of that determining whether the data are reliable and whether they support or refute a given prediction or hypothesis. So the data given to you. Let me give an example. You have two sets of cattle and you want to find out how to feed them, which food is better for them to grow. You may feed one on rice bran. You may feed one on maybe a home waste. You put them in two different rooms, two different, con the same condition, but the food are different. You feed them for about a month. Then you come back and weigh them. Beginning you weigh them, they were almost the same. You fed them, you get them the same water, the same almost condition, just the difference of the food. At the end of the experiment, you weigh them again and find out which one give the best result. Privately, I've said that eating rice bran will make cattle grow better. So at the end of the day, you will check whether it made them grow better or not. If it showed that they increase in weight, then you analyze and say, yes, after one month of giving them the food, this is the outcome. If you didn't give them the food, you have to state that after one month of that, we didn't see any change, or rather they reduced. Then your first statement is not supported. So it means that you have to analyze your data by saying there were 20 of them. Each that I gave them 5 kilograms of food. They ate all. We gave them all the necessary things. But at the end of the experiment, they didn't grow. They are going to analyze what is in the food, what happened, 
and what didn't support their growth. So that you can conclude and say that we fed them, but there's something in their food rather that reduces their weight. So you have to analyze your data and come out with an outcome. Once you are done with analyzing, you make a statement from your analysis or discussion and just put it straight forward. by giving them one month food or ration of uh, five kilograms daily, three times a day, we saw that our cattle reduced in weight. This proved that rice brands do not let cattle grow. Who stop? We have concluded. Because once we want how it did not let them grow, we go to the discussion analysis. They will get a story, the whole input. They will come down and make a statement. In this sense, your first statement that says that rice brand will let them grow has been refuted because the experiment did not support it. For a scientist, you go over his data again. For a scientist, you check whether something went wrong in the experiment. But after that, he repeated it more than once to conclude that doing it seven times, still they were not growing. To come to a conclusion and say that, yes, now I can conclude that rice brand do not let them grow. But if it made them grow maybe 10 kilograms more than what they were, then you conclude and say that by feeding them for one month, it is proven that feeding cattle for one month with 5 kilograms daily, three times a day, the cattle would increase 20% their weight. Then your answer, you've concluded. This is how scientists go about their work. Once you get your job, don't <laughs> jubilate and say, oh, what I thought is true. It's correct. I'm going to tell the whole world. No, you don't do that. <laughs> you have to take your time, my friend. You are not the only scientist in this world. It could be that your experiment has some defects. So you go to meetings or you find a way to communicate your result with other scientists, which is called communication. So you would have to go to conferences. You have to write in journals. You have to publish it in books or magazines. You have to have friends who are scientists and give your whole experiment you did, your hypothesis, give it to them. They will just read through. They even from their own eyes can see problems with probably why you did something. OK. Whatever it is, they will sit down, repeat your own experiment again, and check whether they come to the same facts. If they come to the same fact, thank be to God, then you are gaining some momentum. You'll be gaining some momentum. After this momentum, we'll be able to then conclude and say that your experiment is true or not. Once you are done, another skill that you are supposed to know is classifying, which will be studied in the Form 3. In classification, a student is taught to bring things together Use his common eyes to check things that are similar and things that are different, and learn how to sort them, group them based on similarities and differences. And this is the basis for classifying things in biology. Modeling. Whenever a scientist gets an idea, we cannot always describe the whole experiment, the whole hypothesis, the whole thing. To make teaching and communication, we put things in models. For example, you've all know that the heart has four chambers. It's a model that we use it to say it's four. Then we just draw something and divide it into four. The skeleton, we will draw something to represent it. The kidney, these are models. Either they are in picture form, they are in description form, they are mathematical equation. So force is equal to m times a. It's a model. All these, so science teach with models. So everything in our concept of science is put in models so that you can easily remember it. It gives you a mental picture of what is going on and easy to communicate real life things into simpler forms. The many things that I mentioned, the skills that I have mentioned right now, some are put together to form what we call the scientific method I used to keep mentioning. So the skill is different from the scientific method. What constitutes the scientific method at our SHS level are these six things. You observe and identify problems. 
you define problems, you make an hypothesis, you then put the hypothesis in the experiment, you record your findings, you analyze, and you conclude. These are the six, the plenty skills I mentioned. These are the six that we need to form a scientific method. It was discovered, the person who developed is called Francis Bacon in this year. This is his method, six method which has been simplified above as you just saw. Now, after knowing the skill, getting your scientific method, if you undertake an experiment, you are supposed to write it, as I said, so that you can communicate it. The chart you see on your TV, it's telling you how we write an experiment. First, you have a title of the experiment, stating that light is necessary for photosynthesis. The aim, to prove that light is necessary for photosynthesis. That's why we are doing it. All the equipment, the pot, the, the sand, the plant, and the light source that we use, we have to list them. Then the method you want to carry, the method you use to carry it out, you call it methodology. Most time in our science, we draw any setup, if it's possible to draw, so that somebody who is not nearby can just have a picture view of what happened. Then whatever you observed, as you write it down, it becomes your results. After results, you analyze and discuss it, then you conclude. So at the end of our lesson today, we are, our aim was to help you get to know the, some of the scientific skills needed by a scientist to thrive. There are a lot observing, manipulating, measuring, formulating, hypothesis, predicting, designing, recording data, interpreting results, conclusion. And out of this, we have our scientific method. As I'm about to leave you, these are some questions that has been asked before and that I also want you to try your hands on. When we meet next week, I'll take it from you, grade you, and find out if you're able to answer these questions. On observation, manipulating, hypothesis, control, then apply your assign main assignment, apply this scientific method to determine how the disease caused malaria was discovered. Malaria was discovered using a scientific method and has come to save us in this world. Till we meet next time, this has been your facilitator for your elective biology class, SHS1, or Sir Kwame Amwatin, also called Sir Boys. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV.